I'm very happy this evening to be here to share something that is very, um, I would say, important because family, as you know, is the fabric of society, as uh, Saint John Paul, right? The second say, the fib- uh, family is the fabric of society whereby humanity passes through. Isn't that interesting? Families, family is the fabric of society whereby humanity passes through. What does it mean? I just finished a course, uh, a training course with some of you uh, for Merited First Responder, uh, those who are preparing to help couples with issue. So I, the tendency is to ask questions and hopefully the participants will answer. But given this uh, auditorium here, I'm just wondering how to get you to answer. Uh, how to have some interaction between you and I. So, um, what's the best way to, to ask? Probably I have to ask people in front, all right, since I know them. <laughs> but anyway, uh, humanity passes, fam- uh, f- family is the fabric of society, and humanity passes by way of family. All of us come from families, right? right? And if we are in family, what do we do with our family? How can our family help us to be a better person, a better Catholic then? What do you think? You can take off your mask and speak and go back again. How do you think families can help us to be a better person and a better Catholic or a better Christian? They are Christian brothers and sisters here. So what do you think? Father Larry is here, so I won't ask Father Larry. (laughs) How can families help us to be a better person or a better Christian, Christian Catholic. Anybody? Show by? Okay, who? Parents? Lead by example? Very good. Anybody else? Beside parents, showing example? Verbal communication, right? Okay, good. What else? In fact, it's very important. The role of parents in family. You said the the bar, you set the, the standard, you set what you want your children or your child to do in the family, right? But with that also comes what? With the setting of standards, with the setting of bars, you know, the, or rules and regulations, right? Rather than that, rules and regulations, what do you get? Hmm? Discipline, but also people, Children rebel, so right? They don't like don't like rules. They don't like you know, discipline. They want free and easy, right? Which is uh, not quite possible. So anyway, what we are looking tonight is mental health, mental health, and and our family. What is mental health and what is family? But if we put two together, mental health and family, it's about who we are within our family. Who we are within our family. And I'm trained as a marital and family therapist. I did my training first in uh, London for my master's in the Institute of Psychiatry, King's College. Then um, for my PhD, I went to the University of Minnesota, which is known for family therapy. So there is this well-known family therapist, uh, child psychiatrist, by the name of Salvador Mnuchin, the one who founded so-called or who structural family therapies. How many among you are therapists or counselors? Show of hand. Don't feel shy. You won't answer the questions. Just put up your hands. <laughs> Only a few. I thought uh, I thought I saw. Um, <laughs> okay. So the important thing here is that he says that in the family itself, right? Whatever emotional wounds whatever pain that one experience has to be healed by who? The therapist? Counselors? Who has to heal the wounds? Our friend is... Welcome, Vernon. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good to see you here because you are the one who will be answering questions. <laughs> they just attended the marital first responder. You came with your, miss, your missus. Oh, your friends. Okay, okay. So welcome. 
So according to Salvador Monochin, a very well-known family therapist who died a few years ago, he says that family members must learn how to heal each other's wound. Not we as therapists, not you as counsellors. He says that family members need to heal each other wounds. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> All along, we, we feel that as a therapist, we can help everybody, you know, we can try to heal the wounds and, of our clients or, or of our patients. But it's not true. It says, family members must learn how to heal each other's wounds. And we as therapists provide the safe place, a sacred place for them, for it to happen in session. And this is something I, I remember. I, I met him many, many years ago when he was 80 plus, probably 85, 86. And as an old man, he could stand and teach for one hour without any problem. Just remarkable. He was a Jew, an uh, uh, Argentinian Jew, like Pope Francis huh, from Argentina. So hence, I think families and mental health, they are interconnected, interrelated. It's, it's important. So let's have a look at what mental health and what family affair is all about, okay? I prepared some slides. And tell me if you're falling asleep, right? So I can go and ask you questions. Uh, you know this very well, right? The old picture, Sarawak. That, that was a museum, right? Then, of course, the new, the different dances here in uh, Sarawak. Okay, some familiar. All this from, the pictures are from uh, Google, right? Google picture, you can get that. It says family, it says here that people in families are intimately connected. Whether you like it or not. And there's this famous um, German philosopher, Martin Heidegger. Some of you may know, or some of you may read philosophy, contemporary philosopher, Martin Heidegger. He says, we are being with others. And we are also being human beings uh, unto death. The moment we are born to the moment we die, we are always with people. You cannot be born alone, can you, Vernon? Not right? You have to be born with your mother around, right? So we are being with others from the moment we are born to the moment we die and we are being unto death. That means from the moment that we are born, we are destined for death, which is really a very sober sort of a, a thought. So human beings, we are interrelated, we are interconnected, especially in the family, right? And what happens to one member of the family will influence and affect other members of the family and vice versa. He says that focusing on these connections human connections, and the beliefs that different uh, family members hold about them can be a more valid way of understanding and promoting change in problem-related behavior. So in order to help families, especially individuals who are struggling with mental health issues, it's important to help not the individual alone, understanding their beliefs as well as their uh, struggles, uh, their values, but also as a whole family, understand the whole family, where they are coming from. So hence, as family therapists, we usually work with families. No doubt, a child or maybe a parent suffering from depression or suffering from, a child suffering from self-harm. It's not the child's problem. It is the family problem. Because individually and as a family, we are interconnected and interrelated, as you can see here. Huge family here. This is just outside uh, Chinatown, isn't it? The arch outside Chinatown here. And I was there last night, Chinatown, with Father Joseph Ng or Chun. So this is a traditional Chinese family, as you can see here, huh? traditional Chinese family. And you know very well that in, in families, we have different, what they call, sibling position. You heard of sibling position, right? who is the elders, the second, and the third, and the fourth. And for us as therapists, as counsellors, it's important to know our client's sibling position in the family. Our client's position in the family, whether it's he or she is the eldest, or the youngest, or the, or the middle child. So here you can see, the eldest child, what do you usually call them?
You call them the? The parental child. Very good. The second one? The emotional child. Yes. Why emotional child? The first one is parental child. Why? Because when the parents are not around, the child takes command and control early in life, right? To make sure all the siblings fall into place, right? So from young, he or she has the ability to organize, to instruct, and to tell the other person off, right? The younger one, listen to me, I'm the boss of my mom, that other way. But on the other hand also, of course, there will be resentment against the others, right? Why are you pushing me around? You're not my dad or mom, right? So hence, the eldest one you call the parental child. The second one, the emotional child. The emotional child will be someone who is very in touch with his or her feelings, as well as those people around. It's like a thermometer, you know, barometer or thermometer in the family, right? And the third one, the third child is the lost child. Interestingly, I have a friend, and a um, few years ago, he has this four, four daughters, and the three of them were teenagers. And I noticed we went to hawker center. In Singapore, we have hawker center. I think you have it here, right? To have breakfast. And I noticed that the two girls sat with the family and the third one, she sat alone. <laughs> so that brought back memories. I said, how come this, this girl is sitting alone? It's, it's quite true, you say the, the lost child. Huh? He or she has uh, to do things on his or her own uh, and will leave the rest of the family, right? So that's the lost child, the third child. The fourth child will be the family pet. So this one is what I call family constellation, right? And certain people, they set up certain patterns of interaction, right? As the elders, as the second, as the third and fourth. And the fourth child or the fourth, the family pet, his or her responsibility is to make sure that everybody is happy. So he or she will organize things for the family. He or she will make sure that, you know, if a family gathering, you know, he or she will become a kind of a joker to make sure that everybody is you know, pleased with it. Huh? So hence, I think the family, family uh, positioning is very important for us at least to understand why we do the things that we do in the family. And not only in the family, but outside the family. Because if I know someone out there and he or she is the uh, eldest in the family, my way of interacting with him or her may be slightly different. The same also, if I'm the eldest, the way I interact with you may be different based on how I understand you, as well as the way I've been brought up. If I'm the elders, you know, a lot of elders are in management position because from young, they've learned how to command and control. And most of them are in management position. What about the second child, the emotional? What sort of profession do you think they, are, they get into often? Helping profession, like doctors, nurses, counselors, priests sometimes, huh? So you can see the family positioning has a, in a way, uh, will determine so what kind of work we do later on. So these are what we call family patterns or interactions that we have in our society and in our family as well. All right? How many of you are elders in the family here? Okay. How many are the second in the family? See, father is here. I'm also second. <laughs> I don't know Bishop. Bishop is one from there. Bishop also. <laughs> first. Bishop first. Ah, you see, that's why he's the head of the church here. So there's some truth in it, in this family positioning. Right? So we have to be aware of this family positioning. When it comes to understanding families, family matters, affairs, we need to understand that. And hence, I think, as... I'm talking as a, a, a therapist, is that whenever I see families with issues, especially children uh, with issues, I always look at the family context. I look at the way they interact. I look at the way they talk within the session itself to help me to understand, to make a better assessment. What is happening to this child in relation to his relationship? with his mother and father as well as with his siblings. So for me, whenever I see the family, I always make sure that I invite all those who are emotionally significant to come for session. Right. I know I'm not talking to counsellors and therapists, I have to remind myself, go back to what I have prepared here. Okay. So for me, at least it's important to invite everybody who is emotionally significant to go for the session or therapy. If a child in the 
as an issue. So for people among people in uh, out there, if you know of anyone going for therapy, the child is going from therapy, encourage the parents to join the child to see the therapist. Because you know, as a therapist, we see the child for one hour, maybe once a week or, or twice a week. The rest of the time, what happened to the child? He's at home with his or her parents, right? So hence, whatever we do in session itself, we need the parents to be present. So that at the end of the day, the, present, the parents will continue what we, in a way, have suggested to them to help the child. So if you know of anyone going for therapy, especially they are the children, encourage the parents to go. And it's very important to do so. Okay? And we know that as families bound to have, Issues. Any of you in a family that has no issue, no problem? Free from problem? No, right? All of us, we have certain challenges. I wouldn't say problems, but certain challenges. Right? So in our family, we have challenges. And the challenges comes with what? With the developmental stages. From an infant, to a toddler, to a young child, right? then to a school-going child, then to adolescent, then to late, uh, early adult, and so forth. So there are what we call developmental stages in the, our growth. There are also what we call family stages also, from, uh, from an individual getting into a relationship, getting married, be a young couple, then with children, first child, second child, then with children in school, then later on, you have the adolescents. Then you have eventually adult children. Then you have the emptiness, right? So you see all the developmental stages that we individually have to go through as well as family. And with every developmental stages, we meet challenges. Hence, with these challenges, we need to address them. And some of these challenges are very painful because of probably some behavioral issues of the child or even maybe the husband or the wife. And sometimes also we meet also the end of life, right? For grandparents and so forth and so forth. Right? So that there are challenges within the family. And families need to learn how to negotiate right? those challenges. And we'll see a bit of it later. Okay. Any questions, clarification, comments first before I move on? And I love questions. If you have any questions, I think that will enrich the, the training itself or the, the press today's session. Any questions? Anything that you want? Yes, your name first, then you can ask a question. Yes, your name is? Victoria, yes, Victoria. Yes. If you are a single child, what happened? So you have to take parental child, emotional child, lost child, everything, right? Inside one. <laughs> no, I'm not too... What I would say is if you're an individual child, it depends on your personality. A lot will depend on the personality of the child. But in certain, in China, for a good for example, uh, their brothers or their sisters are not their, their biological, but usually their cousins, right? First cousin and so forth. In China, they have only, in the past, they have one child policy. But even now, a lot of young couples, they do not want to have a child. They do not want to have children. And if they have, it's only one. And the system is such a, that they are allowed to have two or more now. Right? Because there's a, a lack of a new, new birth in, in China. And there's a growing population, aging population. Like in Singapore, you know very well that we are the fastest growing uh, aging population in the world. Maybe not in Asia, but also in the world. Right, Singapore. I think we surpassed that of Japan. So if you are the only child, probably it depends on your personality. Good. Thank you, Victoria. Anybody else? Questions? If you are too shy, uh, you can always write down and give it to me. Or you can just raise your hand and ask where, any questions you may have. Yes. Yeah, your name, please. Lucy, yes. Eight, very good. So you have, what happens if you are the number five? After four, we go back to one. <laughs> so, right? Five will be one. Six will be two. 
7 will be 3. 8 will be 4. So you will be the? You will be a family pet. <laughs> if they are the youngest one, right? But this is just a, a kind of, uh, for us, a kind of uh, a gauge or assessment, right? A, a rough assessment when we are therapists and we ask people, you know, are you the first child, the second child? Help us to, in a sense, give us the orientation how to approach this person. It's a quite an accurate uh, sort of uh, assessment, right? Other question? Thoughts, comments? Don't feel shy. Okay, if not, let me go on to what I have discovered from, of course, a good old Google search. These days we have chat GPT, right? But I went to search at Google. Uh, this is from uh, Google search. And it's quite interesting. It, tell, it tells us something about you here in Malaysia, right? So I, I type in what, how common is mental health issue in Malaysia? You know that at any one time, there are 2.3 million people being affected by mental illness. Isn't that a lot? Singapore, we only have how many million people? Five. <laughs> 2.3 is as good as half the population, right? But this is what, uh, here again, I don't know whether you should take it with a pinch of salt, right? Because this is Google, Google search. But I think it should be quite accurate. Then the second question here is, what is the most common mental health disorder in Malaysia? I think this applies to in Singapore also. Schizophrenia, major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder. Okay. Then I, we ask, what are the main causes of mental health issues in Malaysia? And according to Google search, it says financial difficulties, right? Unemployment as a result probably of COVID, work-related stresses, and family issues. But I think family issues, these are not in isolation, right? We need to think in terms of a, a system. If the father loses his job, what will it cost? Definitely it will cause stresses in the family. It will affect what? It will affect the family dynamics, family relationship, couple relationship. So nothing is in isolation. They are all interrelated and interconnected. And that's what we, we believe. The family is a system, a living system, right? I was just thinking of writing it on the board. So a family is a living system. If one part of the system is not working, it will influence and affect the other system, just like the church also, right? Or the, the body of Christ. The body of Christ has many parts, but all these parts have to work together, right? The head we have here, the Archbishop is the head, Sim Bishop Simon Poe. We are all part of the body of Christ. So if one part is not working well, it affects and influences the other parts of the body. Right? It's the same in the family also. The family is a micro, micro system, right? Where society is a macro system. So hence, family issues uh, here is shown is one of the main mental health issues in Malaysia. This is something uh, interesting, I would say, we need to take note of. Then we ask the question: what is the level of mental health problems in Singapore. So according to the latest uh, ministry, Malaysian Ministry of Health, it, it identifies the prevalence of mental disorder among adults. Huh? Adults, I mean, I presume 18 and above or 21. It's at what? 29%. Isn't that high? 29%. And this is a threefold increase in comparison to the 10% prevailing rate identified in 1996. So we are really in, in, uh, in need of help, all right. Um, so what is the mental health uh, issues among youth in Malaysia? And you can see over there, this is the, the prevalence uh, of mental health among children is worrying, according to the expert. It says one in 20 children in Malaysia, aged five to nine, are estimated to have mental disorder, including developmental disorder. One in 20 is quite high, right? So what can we do as a church? What can we do as 
members of the society, right? Of the Sarawak society, what can we do? So in fact, there's a great need. There's a great need for individuals to really be into the helping profession, especially in the mental health profession. And what are some of these, uh, what you call um, mental health issues among young people, youth in Malaysia, as you can see here, it says that uh, around half a million, they will say, yeah, have mental issues, right? Mental issues. And however, a lot more are not coming forward because of stigma. And sometimes coming to see a counselor, coming to see a therapist at the booth, right? No family wants to be known or to be seen as uh, having a child having problems, let alone parents. I'm just talking about children, right? They are also parents with emotional, psychological issues. And from research studies, we know that if parents have emotional or psychological issues, it's influence and affect the children and the family, whether you like it or not. So for us as families, is how can we protect our children, care for them, even though some members of our families have emotional issues or struggles, right? And it's very important to address that. And it's nothing to be ashamed of if you have mental illness, right? So widespread in Malaysia among you for the issue of drugs, okay? And I hope there are your Malaysian families, the Malaysian families here, we, we need to support uh, those people with drugs in terms of rehab, right? Send them, as we know, send them for good rehab. In general, it says that what are some of the common mental uh, illnesses among youth or in the youth population? And these are the four. ADHD, in short, or the full uh, ADHD means attention deficit hyperactivity, Disorder, it means what? It means someone cannot sit still, right? And it's more prevalent among boys rather than girls in school, right? You notice primary school kids, right? Sometimes they cannot sit still. They have to run, disturb someone, they have to talk, right? They cannot sit still for more than 10 or 20 minutes, right? This is what we call the ADHD children. Um, others, common um, mental health issues, anxiety problem. This is more so among girls. ADHD, usually among boys, right? Uh, young boys, you can, in fact, the earlier you uh, diagnose, the child is being diagnosed, the better it is to get treatment, to get help, right? So there are medication, but usually I would say medication is only one alternative. The other one would be behavioral, behavioral changes, right? And that needs therapy. Yeah. So beside medication, there'll be therapy needed. Family can come in to help the child, right? Anxiety problems also are very common among the, the women or girls. Others will be behavioral problems, other sort of behavioral problems, bullying, fighting. You can think of all the behavioral problems, right? You know, some children have. And lastly, depression, very common among teenagers, especially girls. So hence, I think we really need to... Why you say girls, they, they are more... What is the definition of depression or is what the definition of depression is? Anger turns inwards, right? When you're depressed. And usually what they do when people are depressed, some of them may get into self-harm behaviors. They cut themselves, right? Or what they do? They hit themselves. What they do? They engage in dangerous behavior. So hence, I think as parents, as siblings, as members of family, we need to be on the lookout for children or for siblings who are not well. We need to support them with all possible help. So this is the breakdown you can see here. Depression happens often, teenage, 12 to 17. You see the peak there, the depression. For anxiety, it's the same also. So teenage years are challenging years, not only for the child, but also for the whole family. Right, because as I say, you know, if you have a toothache, it's not only your tooth that is aching, right? What happens? Your whole body aches. Yeah? Your body is, whole body is uncomfortable. And if a child is having depression or anxiety disorder or having eating problems, yeah? we call it anorexia nervosa, it affects and influences the whole family. And behavior issues, you see, beginning six, but it will, it depends on what kind of behavior issues, right? 
So it, hence, we have to understand that children in their developmental stages, they face lots of challenges. And we as parents, you as parents, as siblings, how best can we help them? And a quick answer, maybe quick answer is not the right thing to say, but a, a quick thing is to visit a good counsellor right? or a good psychologist or a good family therapist to help the child manage. The earlier the child gets support, gets the treatment he or she needs, the better it will be for the child in future as well as for the whole family. It is a family effort, family work. It says it takes a village to raise a child, right? We know that very well. Okay. Any question first? Question, clarification, comments with regards to what you have just seen here on the screen. Clear? You know, as teachers, we have the habit of to ask clear. Even though they are not clear, they say clear. <laughs> it's okay. But we move on. We can ask questions. And one of the things I, I usually appreciate is uh, during lunch, not lunch time, during break time, they will come and ask questions. But it will be good if you ask questions now so that the rest of us can benefit from your question. Because some of us are afraid to ask. But this is a question that all of us need to, to answer. Yes, Victoria. Yes. Good question. Can adult have ADHD? The answer is yes. However, over the years, they are, much, they are able to handle the ADHD much better. So usually there's a peak. Then after which, they'll go down. And the older you are, the better you'll be. <laughs> you have one of our Jesuit priests, I think I suspect he has ADHD because he cannot sit still, right? He'll run all over the place, right? Any funeral, he will go. Any people sit, sit call, he will go. But he's very pastoral. <laughs> but he cannot sit still. The moment he sits, he will fall asleep. You know who I bring to. But when the teacher asks question, he will give the right answer. Isn't that marvelous? Right? So some of us, or some of you have the ability to pay attention while not sleeping, while closing your eyes, right? Because you're concentrating 100%. No? So it's very important. Okay, so yes, ADHD will it does exist in adult, but the, the what you call the intensity of the the behavior, right, will be much lesser. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Grace, right? <laughs> yes. What's the behaving problem? Okay. How you know the child is having behavior? Okay, very good. How you know a child is having a behavior problem as compared to being a child? Age appropriate. Usually we say it's age appropriate. That means if a child is four years old, you act as a four years old child. Right? If a child knows, knows running around at that age and all that, fine. But if you notice there's something that is out of the ordinary, for example, probably the Child is three, four, or in school, school age, beginning school age is a good, good indicator, right? A good to let you know whether the child is behaving in comparison with other children around him or her. So teachers, very good. If you are teachers, identify those children that are, who cannot sit still, who talks, and I mean some some children are just active, right? Whereas other children are over the board, right? So those are the children that the teachers they have to identify and send them for assessment. In Singapore, we do that and I think it's very important to identify these children and to help them cope better, in, especially in class. You know what happens if you are not treated? You fall behind your class, right? You fail the exam and all that. Then you affect your self-esteem as a child, as you grow up, right? Because everybody is doing reasonably, they pass and you are lacking behind because you cannot focus, exams you can't go and so forth and so forth. There are other issues. So the hope is that it should be age appropriate. If not, then in school, maybe the first year, primary one, primary two, you know, they will identify some of this. And some of the issues can be identified earlier. For example, autism. Autism is a spectrum, right? Autism. So if you are able to identify them early, get treated. I have a friend of mine, 
her daughter is identified with autism at the age of two. You know, I mean, some of which you can. So the earlier you get assessment, get diagnosed, the earlier will be better for the child. So hence, we need to keep that in mind. Good. Thanks, Grace. Anybody else? Vernon, yes, go. I plant these people here so that they can ask questions. No? <laughs> yes, Vernon. Yes. Right, right. But this is a kind of a term that is widely used huh, in the medical world or in the other word we can use is psychological or emotional. Right? Psychological. Yeah. So, uh, Gray, uh, Gray. You ask Google, la. I didn't put mental, la. Google put mental, so I follow my Google. Yeah. Very good. You see how society perceives illnesses, especially mental illness, and how we perceive it, right? So hence, part of what we do is social media, those are in social media, we have to educate ourselves. Instead of using mental illness, which is very, uh, you get a sort of a stigma, right? We need to change it as emotional, or we can call it psychological, emotional psychological illness, right? Or call it childhood, childhood illness, right? Or illnesses. So the term that we use is very important. Um, as what uh, Wittgenstein, some of you may know, right? Philosopher, uh, philosophy of language. The limit of our language is the limit of our world. Right? The limit of language. So words, language, very important. How we use it, how we phrase it. So in hospital these days, right? Some of the terms they don't use anymore. I don't know some of the terms you may know that they don't use the term anymore. But patients are still patients. Why are they called patients? Because they have to wait patiently for the doctor each day, right? To come and see them. That's why they are patients. <laughs> for us, people coming to see us, we don't call them patients. We call them what? Clients. Very good. We call a spit a spit. <laughs> but in hospital, everybody is called a patient. So in the hospital, they call me doctor. In the church, they call me father. In school, they call me professor. But it's just a name, right? The important thing is, are you able to help? So don't be put off by the, the term. But to be conscious of it is important. Right? The term. Other questions? Clarification? Yes. Your name is? Oliver. Oliver. Yeah. Yes. Sober. Yes. Mm. Well, there are two things here we are, we are considering. Being sober is like, for example, alcoholic. Can, a, can an alcoholic right, be in depression? Yes, of course. Which, which is which? Sometimes it's depression pushing the person to drink a lot, excessive. Sometimes it's the other way around. To drown his or her sorrows, right? So hence, I think we have to be careful. Um, Often, what we call in, uh, in the hospital, there are, it's a term what we call comorbidity. That means not only one illness, but the number of it, a combination of it. So sometimes a child may have ADHD. In addition to ADHD, he may have other behavioral problems. Right? So he may have what we call uh, OCD. You heard of OCD, right? obsessive compulsive behavior. That means you do things in a very ritualistic way. If you wash hand, you have to wash many times. If you turn off the light, you have to make sure it's turned off many times. If you look under your bed, you have to look under many times before you sleep, right? So this is what you call OCD, obsessive compulsive behavior. How many of you have OCD? <laughs> See, very honest one. I also have OCD, why? 
because when you say when you do your PhD, uh, you have to check uh, your for your paper, uh, this stage, all the commas or the first stop, no, cannot miss any of it. Uh, so you have to go back and refer and refer. Say most of people uh, with PhD, they are OCD, you know. Right? So it's nothing to be ashamed of, right? Mental illness. In fact, I don't have. Uh, I mean, after my PhD, I left everything behind. Huh? So it's very important to take note that it's not only one form of men, uh, emotional illness or psychological illness. Usually it comes in two or threes, right? So if a child has it, a child may be facing a lot of struggles, right? So as parents, you need to identify, you need to help and support. And who is the best person to support a child? Or a family member? People outside? Yes, maybe, but more so in, within the family. As I mentioned earlier, right? We have to heal each other's wounds. And a lot of emotional wounds, I would say, they are caused by family members, right? Probably knowingly or unknowingly, parents to, to children or children to parents or to each other in the emotional wounds. And hence, family members need to heal each other's wounds. And a lot of cases that we meet for adults, for example, huh? a lot of them have childhood or uh, what they call it, developmental wounds right? encountered or inflicted by family members and they carry with them all the rest for the good part of their life. And some even with traumas, right? You heard of traumas, right? Or abuse, physical abuse, okay? So we need to remember to, as far as possible, help these people, if we are able to. Okay, other questions before I move on? Good. So what is the biggest or problem facing youth today, our young people today, right? These are the four, cost of living, according to the, the five concerns for 2023. Uh, three. Cost of living, the world around us, personal failure, future, relationship and exams. And Singapore, I think also here in Malaysia, right? Exams is a way of going up the social ladder, right? Climbing up the social ladder. So a lot of children are under stress because parents give them unnecessary stress, right? They want the best for their children. The best means you get to get, you have to get full marks or close to full marks, 99.9. Sometimes it's quite impossible, right? So you ask yourself, why do you want your, your not maybe not you, why do you, want, why do you find that parents want their children to have better scores every time? Every time you have to go up, the scores have to go up, which is sometimes it's not practical, right? There'll be moments in which, you know, exam, you are tired, exam fatigue, or some other reasons, they, they are not able to perform. But yet, parents, they expect their children to perform. And especially what we call tiger moms, right? I hope none of you are tiger moms, right? They, they want the children to really perform at the highest possible rate. So this is the, the source I got it from. All right. At this point, I want to show you, not from Google, but from research article based on researchers who are qualified to do the research that they, they, they are doing, right? So these are research journal articles about what? Mental disorder in Malaysia. Something to take note of. The first one, you saw a set of uh, slides. They are from Google, but this one from researchers, professionals who know what they are talking about, right? So it says, there's an increase uh, in lifetime prevalent. What is that? Increase in what? What do you guess? Would you like to guess what's the increase in Malaysia with regards to mental disorder? An increase in what illness or what, uh, what issue, mental issue, psychological issue among people in Malaysia? You make a guess. Hmm? Drugs? No. Depression, yeah. Suicide. Suicide among young people. If, even in Singapore, we have a rise of youth people, uh, young people. And of course, they don't publish it in newspaper, right? They are afraid of what? Copycat, right? So hence, uh, we really have to take into consideration the mental health of young people because they are killing themselves. And the attempted suicide, usually among among the young, for women, they attempt suicide, but most of them survive. But 
but for boys, if they attempt suicide, usually it's completed suicide. Right? So we have a number of boys, even in our, sad to say, one boy from our parish also jumped. Boys, I think they know how to kill themselves as compared to girls. So for boys, I think take special notes of them if they are suffering from depression. Often it's a, maybe from bullying or from whatever, you know. Or you have heard in Singapore, right? A boy who was bullied, he went around using an axe, right? That he killed one of uh, older school boys, right? That boy did not bully him. <laughs> right? He just went bonkers, right? So we need to really help our young people. But don't forget that mental illness doesn't only hit the young people, but also the elderly, right? So all throughout the lifespan. Yeah. So have a look at this one right first. Um, this you know very well, the population in uh, Malaysia, 32.6 million in 2020, right? And it has increased uh, than the distribution of the population there, the Malays, the Chinese, and the rest of And the mean age of people, this uh, research was conducted probably in 2020, so quite very recent, right? So it gives us an idea what is happening here. So the median age of people in Malaysia, 30.3, relatively young as compared to Singapore, right? And the average life expectancy, so all of you can live up to at least minimum 73.2 years. But be careful about statistics. Right? What they say about statistics, we have lies, damn lies and statistics. <laughs> So be careful of statistics. Huh? So it, however, it gives us an idea of what's the, so the average. So most of you can expect to live up to way beyond your 70s, which is good. And these days, probably like uh, Archbishop Emeritus, 90, 90 over, right? Okay. And according to this article also, it, it mentioned that uh, a lot of cases are in, for example, the emotional cases or mental illnesses are in the gruller area. They call it mental disorder, 43%, followed by closely by the capital KL. So you go KL, you must be very careful, right? Because there are a lot of crazy people around, <laughs> according to these statistics. But it's not true, right? So do not take everything, statistics like gospel truth. So be careful with statistics. Yeah. But anyway, when I go to the States, when I was in state, I usually don't come out at night because you never know what kind of people out there, right? So this is just to give an idea what is happening out there based on uh, the research findings. It's important to take note that there has been a dramatic increase in the prevalence of mental disorder over the past decades in Malaysia. No doubt you have increase in income, better quality of life, urbanization, globalization, but it comes with a price, right? And what is this? The, the cost of it, the price of it, yeah. Increase in marital separation. Changes in traditional parenting style. These days, you cannot tell your, your children, right? Listen to me. I'm your mother or I'm your father. For stop, right? What would they say? Bye, mom. Bye, dad. <laughs> right? They'll do their own thing. So these days, I think parenting style has to be different. What's how, how different? I noticed that young couples or young parents, they learn how to parent their child through explaining to them, you can't do this because you know, this is not right, that is not right. But at the end of the day, sometimes do not spare the rod. You have to use it, you have to use it, right? In the West, you can't. But in, in our Asian context, I think if you need to use the rod, use the rod. But be careful what you do with the rod. So, we, uh, so that's the one. But the worrying part is the increase of suicide uh, ideation. Suicide ideation. That means thinking about killing himself or herself, right? And here in Malaysia, it says that 6.9% of the adolescents had attempted suicide one or more times during the previous 12 months. Six or close to 7% of the ad adolescent population. Right? So we need to really uh, help those who are in need, especially children. Question, clarification, comments? This is the end of the first part. Questions, clarification, comment. Yes, your name first. 
Jo, yes, Jo. Yes. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Yes, there's this formula we say, the G and E. G multiplied by E. Of course, maybe you have to take it down. It's genetic and environment. There's a play, interaction between genetic and environment. So a child, whether the child has bipolar, whether a child has ADHD, whether a child has, part of it is genetic. The other part of it is environment. How the environment, whether it's a, are there protective factors to, to take care of the child or whether there are other factors, contributing factors to the behavior, right? So it's usually an interplay, the G and E, genetic and environment, has to do with how the child behaves. But a lot of it, as you say correctly, is genetic, right? So we cannot blame the child. Why are you like that? Why are you like If you look at, especially we as therapists, we use a genogram. A genogram is what we call an emotional family tree. A genogram will help us understand not only the medical history of the family, but at the same time also the psychological history of family. And if you look at depression, it has a family history, right? If you look at suicide also, there's a family history. Then for the medical part of it, you know very well if your father has diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, if your mother has it, very likely we will have it. It's a package deal. You cannot run away. Right? No matter how careful you are, you may have one or two. You may escape no the rest. Huh? But it is genetic. So hence, when we look at the genogram, which is called the family tree, three generations, we look at the patterns what one person has, depending on the rest of the family, your grandparents, your parents, yourself, auntie, uncles, but usually three generations. It will give us an idea of what is happening to you. That's why they have the genetic test for some uh, couples who are thinking of marriage, right? There may be some genes in which he or she may have to take note of, right? So hence both genetic and environment. There's an interplay interaction. So a lot of children, they have issues. If you look clearly, sometimes maybe their father or their mother may have it before, right? Eating disorder is the other one also. Self-harm, yep. Okay. So we need to understand the history of the family, both medical as well as psychological. So hence on this piece of paper, the family genogram, they have the two lists of it. We need to take family history. Okay. Others, before we go for a short break? No, okay. Let's go for a 10 minutes break, right? So my time is 8.30. Let's come back by 8.40. Uh, we're going to be blessed because ultimately we realize we've spent, the diocese has focused on the family. Family is important. And then many of you I know from uh, younger days, now we are parents. Some will be parents, some are great parents. So it's a challenge always uh, with new generation of children. As they grow up, uh, things are changing. This is the digital, digital age and the stress point, the issues are different. Schools are facing it. And it's good that as we look at our family, we can also help to uh, bring about blessing for our family. So for, the, for us, families are very important. And so I, I hope that with this session, you will give us insight into the family and then we can form support group to help one another uh, to journey and help our children, grandchildren, and bless the generations to come. And sometimes a session like this is not just about uh, the children that we are struggling with. It's a time also to take a step back and relook at how our own childhood, our own uh, upbringing is impacting the way also. So it's a journey outwards looking at how to resolve problem, how to minister, but at the same time, it's also a journey in order to see how we can also help ourselves to understand the situation and uh, maybe to find also peace within ourselves and in so doing, pass on the positive vibes, uh, the care, the love to the children. Uh, I remember the story of uh, 
What's the story uh, this Caesar? Dog Whisperer, is it? What do you call it? What's the movie called? Caesar, what's it? Not 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 the not the uh Planet of the Apps, but the other Caesar. Caesar Milan. What's the what's the what's the move what's the what's the series called? Dog Whisperer, is it? Uh, Dog Whisperer. I used to watch that. I haven't seen it for quite a while. I think it was on Astro long ago. We have no more Astro, so I <laughs> I can't, I don't know whether it's on Astro or not. But I remember that when people asked him to help them with the dogs. You've seen those movie, the series? And after talking to the owner and the dogs, actually the problem is not the dog. <laughs> the problem is how the owner is uh, giving the wrong signal, triggering the dog to react in certain way. So it's when the owner, when Caesar Milan, he helped the owner to modify the behavior, the dog became a dog, <laughs> a normal dog. So it's something like this, I think it's good also sometimes to look at within, not just out. And it's good once we start learning to see, let me see how it can help. So let the reflection by Father Charles, I think he gives us a lot of insight. We look inwards. At the same time, we are also preparing to share and move outwards. It's always an inward journey. And the Jesuit will tell you, this is called discernment, Father Larry. <laughs> they are both Jesuits, so they'll tell you that. All right, so I pray that with this, you'll be blessed and uh, we'll continue organizing such sessions so that you also enable us to be a better person, a better Christian, a better Catholic. And in so doing, we also bless our family and bless a few families in the future to come. So thank you, Father Charles, uh, for the invitation. And I saw we'll come you for this pro bono. He comes here, does everything for us. Uh, he's just he's his gift to the church of uh, in, in Kuching here. So thank you very much, Father Charles. Thank you very much, Your Grace. Uh, I have my Jesuit uh, brother here, Father Larry. He pays for everything. <laughs> he's the boss. Okay. Um, His Grace mentioned one thing very important, right? That family members, we have to reflect on ourselves, especially parents, right? Or grandparents. I remember just uh, a case that I saw a couple of years ago uh, in the hospital referred by uh, the child psychiatrist. I was asked to see a very smart girl, uh, probably in her, here it's Form 4 or Form 5, I can't remember. So, Intelligent girl, but she's cutting herself. She's pulling her hair and she faints in school, right? So a few things, right? Not only self-harm, but pulling her hair as well as fainting spells in school. So they check, they run a, tra uh, a kind of a test. Nothing biological, nothing physical. So the psychiatrist say, probably this has to do with not mental, but emotional right? Psychological. So the, the psychiatrist referred her to see me. So I, I, when I saw the medical record, usually I would say, you know, can the parents accompany? So the first time the father came, uh, high powered CEO of some company, right? Then he came uh, with the daughter. Then we said, we talk, not we talk, but we did the assessment. I did the assessment and to find out about family, the genogram and all that about her behavior, what is happening there. Then I say, where is the mother? The mother is in the hospital. The mother is a consultant, not in the hospital. <laughs> so uh, I said, well, if she's able, please get her to come. It's a high, another high flyer in the hospital. So medical, medical uh, consultant. So she came. Then in the course of our session, in the course of our family therapy, I, uh, I found that the mother is a kind of a tiger mom, right? And she's always overlooking the daughter's work. Three, three, three children, but she's the eldest, right? So she always overlook her work. I mean, go through the paper and all that. In fact, really like a, like a tiger mom, not hog eye, you know? making sure that everything, the activities wise and all that. So this poor girl is under great, a uh, lot of pressure, not from the mom. But the, her relationship with the father was just great. <laughs> so when I look in short, and when I look at the dynamics, I, I notice that the mother is over-functioning. 
right? Like most good mothers, they overfunction. But the father was underfunctioning. He would just drive the girl to school, the children to school, if possible, not someone can get back, or he would do the nice things with them, uh, with the, the girls, and the girls enjoy it. But the mom is the one really disciplinary, looking around, making sure that everything is okay, checking their homework and so forth and so forth. And she's very stressed. And what happens when she's stressed? She gets it out, sometimes on the children, right? And the elders in the family gets it the most. Some of you may experience that huh? in your growing up years. So one of the recommendations I gave, understanding the, the situation a bit better, I recommended that the mother step down and the father step up. Instead of the mom do all the checking of the books and all that, and all the activities and all that, making sure that she's good, father will have to do that. And I asked the father, are you willing to do that? If not, every, her problem will continue. She'll continue cutting herself. She'll continue have fainting spells in school. She'll continue to pull her hair, her own hair, until almost like ball. Huh? Do you want that if you don't want to help? And the father was great. He said, okay, I'll take over. However, as you know very well, once you have command and control, uh, mother, it's very difficult to let go, right? <laughs> you let go one, you take that two, right? But the mother, she had to do that. In fact, she did. And over a period of time, the daughter's condition improved. It's interesting to, uh, to see the dynamics, family dynamics. When the father stepped up, instead of the father doing all the nice things, I recommended the mother to do the nice things with the daughter, like example. I asked them, what do you like to do to baking? Why not you bake? With, do baking with your daughter, go shopping with your daughter, do all the fun things except homework and all that. No? Let the father take over. And in fact, she was a very smart girl who doesn't need no supervision. But the very fact that the mother is overlooking no, her shoulder, making sure that she felt the, the tension, the stress, right? Anxiety. So sometimes, or most of the times, with good therapy, right? With good therapy, you can do a lot more. And if you get a good family therapist, your child can be helped. But however, as what uh, this Grace mentioned, both everyone in the family must work together. The parents must reflect what they have done or what they have not done. And how can they cooperate? With these two parents, they are very, or they were very committed. So it helps the therapy session. Okay? So this is a nice <laughs> ending to that. But there are other cases quite, I mean, it's a really struggle because the problem is not with the child. The problem usually is with who? Parents. So hence, as family therapists, we not only work with the child, but we work with the parents, their relationship. And usually I would say the manifestation, the symptoms of the child is always a manifestation of the marital relationship between husband and wife. So hence, if you want to help the child, make sure you also help the parents. <laughs> and you need to have the skills to help them. It's quite challenging working with parents, right? But I believe that if the parents are willing to come with the child for counseling or therapy, 50% of the job is done, right? Because when they come, they are most probably, or they are very willing to help. If they are not willing to help, they don't come. And as therapists, usually we say, bring your husband along. Then the wife will say, my husband will not come because you no, know, the parenting is all up to me. Then. I remember my old professor, uh, old uh, consultant, he said, tell the husband that the doctor needs to see you to help you help the child. <laughs> so it's not coming as a problem person, he's coming here to help me solve the problem. So please ask your husband to come to help me help your child. So when he comes, he comes as a consultant, right? He consult me as a father, rather than I am to be blamed or I am part of the problem, right? So I think that's very important. Usually we say that. Okay, so you need to remember, uh, I believe I am preaching to the converted. Like in church, right, we preach to who? Those who are church, they are really good people, right? Those who are not in church, they are outside. They should be one, huh? we should be preaching to, right? So among all of you, I think you are good parents. Good enough parents, right? Good enough grandparents. So the challenge here is how to help others, as the bishop say. So it's a very much a lot of work we can do here, especially if... Uh, Father, uh, Larry with Nelly and uh, Kimberly, you can give them your support in really building up the, for lack of a better word, mental health <laughs> community. Yeah. Okay, I think that's important, especially when it is psycho, uh, 
psycho spiritual based. Psycho spiritual based. I think that's very important. We cannot look at just the psychology part of it. We always have to include the spiritual element because we are not only physical beings; we are spiritual beings also. And I think my my uh, participants, previous participants, they have heard this right. That according to Taya de Chardin, a very famous uh, Jesuit writer as well as a geologist who was instrumental in discovering the Peking man in China, right? He says we are spiritual being having a physical experience. We are spiritual being having a physical experience. So all of you ask here, we are spiritual beings by having a physical experience. So hence, do not forget the spiritual dimension of family as well as the mental health, right? You always have to have both, not one or the other. Is it okay, class? Is it okay, participants? <laughs> so used to class. <laughs> All right, we have about 45 minutes and I want to leave the last at least 10 minutes for Q&A, right? So I'll go through the slides quickly. Since I prepared it, might as well share it with you. It says, most people believe that mental health conditions are rare and happen to someone. But in fact, it's happening to our family members. And I'm not surprised why you're here. It's because maybe a member of your family or those whom you love and care out there may be experiencing emotional distress, right? So it is not uncommon. And hence, there shouldn't be a sort of a, a taboo there that if you are mentally not well, that means you are damaged. <laughs> it's not true. All of us have struggles. Even those who are healthy generally, Right? From some point in your life, you may experience moments of stress, moments of depression, being depressed. It's very normal. Right? If not, then we, are, we, are, we will be superhuman beings. Right? So, and what is mental illness? This is what I say. Mental illnesses are brain-based conditions that affect thinking, emotion, and one's behavior. Right? And uh, having some kind of mental problem during your life is really common. We need to normalize. Because if not, we think that all of us are healthy. But the fact is, we are not. You know what is the difference between a psychosis and a, a neurosis? <laughs> What's the psychosis, difference between the psychosis and neurosis? Most of us have neurosis. <laughs> what, the, what do I mean most of us have neurosis? Are we problematic? No. People with neurosis, they can still function. They are high-functioning people, even with autism, right? They are high-functioning autism. They can be, you know, researchers and all, and all that. But all of us have some type of neurosis. What does? What do I mean? Some of us have OCD, right? We check many times before we sleep. Our gate, our dog, and whatever, whatever it is, it's okay as long as you are able to function normally outside. You are able to hold down a job. And hence, according to Freud, you know Simon Freud, the father of psychoanalysts, what is his definition of a healthy person? You know? You know, teachers, are, we ask questions, then we answer our own question, right? It is an occupational hazard. So what is the definition of a healthy person? Coming from Freud, uh, 80s, uh, Jewel. Uh, it's the ability to work and the capacity for love. That's the definition of a healthy person, according to Freud, Simon Freud. Huh? The ability for work and the capacity for love. Isn't that interesting? Coming from the 80s, coming from uh, the father of psychoanalysis. Okay, so are you, are you capable of loving? Yes, of course, right? Do you have the ability for work? Yes, so generally you are a healthy person. We are not perfect person, but we are generally a healthy person because we can work and we can love. Two basic things, right? And all of us are capable of. Okay, so keep that in mind. And all of us, of course, we, we experience extreme uh, or unexpected change in mood if you are having some struggles or crisis. And crisis, what are crisis in Chinese? What's the definition of crisis in Chinese? Wei Qi, and the words Wei Qi, someone if you want to write, means opportunity as well as danger. 
right? Weiji, if you're Chinese character. So in a crisis, there's this opportunity for growth. But if we do not handle the crisis well, then of course there will be danger. Right? So the Chinese, uh, very, <laughs> there's this important character. Every character of Chinese is, there's a meaning to it, right? So hence, I think we need to take note of. Here it says that there are 200 uh, classified forms of mental illness, right? The common ones are what we usually hear and see, depression, bipolar, dementia, right? For especially we have an aging population, Singapore, we are bracing ourselves for dementia as well as Alzheimer's. Hence, we have organizations looking into that. But I believe a research paper that I read many, many, many uh, years ago that our brain cells die a little, even at the age of 80. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? So our brain is just like a muscle, right? You exercise the muscle. If you go to gym, exercise, not our cell, huh? those people who are gym, right? You see the muscles, they build up the muscles. The brain is also muscles. The more you exercise, the better it will be, the longer you can use. So we have two elderly uh, parishioners here. They are still exercising their brain, right? Coming, listening, which is very good, right? They will live a long and fruitful life with the mental faculty, which is important. For some of us, if we don't use our, our brain, what happens? <laughs> you know the result of it, right? Eventually, you'll forget who we are. You know the joke, right? Um, the man and the wife and some friends around, then he forgotten the name of the wife. Then he asked his friend, do you know that that, that flower with the, the thorn? What, what is it called? Rose, ah. Uh, I rose, you know, I need my coffee now. Huh? <laughs> right. So you have to use your brain. Huh? If you don't, then after that, you have a problem, right? So the, the, these are the common ones, right? And symptoms may include, for example, change in mood, personality, behavior, habits, and social withdrawal. Right? All these are some of the manifestation of the common uh, mental disorder. And a lot has to do with stress. And you have to be very careful. If you are not very careful with our... You know what is the best way of uh, managing stress? We know it very well, right? What? Exercise? You say, yes, very good. What else? How to manage stress? Eat. Not eat. Uh. <laughs> huh? Sleep. Very good. Maybe we eat also important. Eat healthy food, right? I mean, those I always say, you know, uh, health, good things you know, need a bit only, right? Good things you only need a bit, but bad things you can have more. For example, drinking, smoking, eating, uh, you can have more, right? Bad things we can have more. But good things only need a bit only. So be careful of what we eat. Let's say what we eat will be who we are. So sleep, eat properly. Exercise, what else? For stress. How to make better manage stress? Shopping. <laughs> online, online shopping. Yeah. So these are some of the things that we can help ourselves. But the important thing is support from family members. Good conversation, good family life, good conversation with people that we know and trust to talk about it. Some people feel that talking doesn't help, but in fact, it helps a lot. But some people talk too much, right? So, <laughs> but this is a form of stress release also when they talk, right? And some people talk because they feel anxious and by talking about it, they feel much better, which is helpful, which is helpful. So do not discount talk therapy. Do not discount having family support, which is very important. Often when I see uh, not only children, but families, uh, especially the, adult, the adults. Recently, I just saw a, a couple, a husband and wife, who came to see me for therapy. In the course of the session, I find out a bit more, found that the children are also having struggles. And sometimes it's not only the couple prob having problems. Even the children, in a way, they are influenced and affect, affected by the couple's struggles and quarrel. And research has shown, huh? even couples that have cold war, their young children can pick up that. Their adolescent children can pick up the stress as well as the tension in the family, even though parents are not saying anything because they've done the research on it to measure their 
pulse rate, to measure their perspiration, to measure their breathing, heart rate, and so forth. Right? So even though parents are not on good, you know, if parents are not on good terms, it can it will influence and affect those living in the family, even though it's not spoken, even though it's a cold war. So whatever you do as parents or as as would be parents, take note of that. Right? Because whatever struggles, whatever quarrels and fight in the family weakness by children, it will have an influence. And children usually they are fear, they're afraid of what? The divorce, right? They fear that what will happen to me if my parents divorce, if my parents are separated. Right. So they cause a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress for them. And it can manifest itself in psychological or emotional issues. Right. So mental health is very important. And what it will be very important is the faith of the family, religion, our faith, our religion. It's a what you call a preventive factor. Or it's, in fact, it's a factor that will help mediate whatever stresses you have. Faith, religion is very important. If you are practicing, if you are not practicing, then of course it doesn't help. Hence, we say that our first resource should be God rather than last resort. Our first resource should be going to God rather than God is our last resort. So faith in the family, prayer, uh, religious routine, those are very important. Family meals together. Family meals are very important. You know very well that within the family, during families, where you really talk about issues, right? And one-to-one -one session with your, your child, which is very important. Okay. So let's keep that in mind. All these factors that will help us have a healthier family. As according to here, it says, mental illnesses may be caused by a reaction to environmental stresses, loss of job, change of place, quarrel with you know, your superior and so forth. Beside that, we have the genetic factors, the G and E, remember. Right? or bio, uh, biochemical imbalances in the brain. And a lot of it can be treated with good medication. So for depression, what do we do for depression? Usually, if it's detected early, uh, acute depression, right? it can be treated well through three things, right? You know very well. First will be medication. Second will be therapy. Third will be exercise. If three of these are put in place early on, for a depressed person, it helps. But if it's a chronic depression, then it will be a challenging. And you have heard of people suffering from chronic depression and killing themselves, right? We have friends who, are, who have experienced chronic depression over the years and parishioners you know, killing themselves at the, time, at the end of the week. So hence, mental illness, if it's addressed earlier, given the kind of treatment or medication needed, usually it's a combination, therapy, as well as medication. It helps. The earlier, the better. So what are the warning signs and symptoms of family with uh, a child or family members with mental uh, issue, right? Pay attention to sudden changes in thoughts and behavior. That's one, right? If your husband and your wife is doing something very strange, unless the person tells you I'm doing something strange, right? You pay attention to that, right? The second one is to look at the onset of several of these symptoms below, right? And one of it is, is uh, and not just any one change. Usually it comes, there's, there are indicators. And if you live long enough with a person you know, some of the behavioral changes, strange behavior changes, right? So you need to take note of it. Okay. These are some of the things that you may want to take note of in young children. Some of the changes that may indicate that he or she is having some struggles or some emotional issues. For example, young children, uh, changes in school performance, right? Probably the guy, the girl or the guy is doing reasonably well, then suddenly you get all zero, 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 or refusal to go to school, stomach ache, like, headache, uh, vomiting, whatever it is, right? if it's over a period of time. Then poor grades, despite strong uh, uh, efforts, change in sleeping or eating patterns. And for younger children, of course, if they wet the bed, right? So these are things uh, you need to take note of. Eating habits will be, uh, I don't know, <laughs> from not eating vegetables to eating vegetables. 
<laughs> it's strange, right? But it's true. So you better take note of it. Excessive worry or anxiety, this often happens huh, to, to children, especially when parents are fighting or quarreling every day or every now and then. It affects the mental health, right? So they can't, they, they feel that no, they will lose their mother or their father, right? And some of them, they refuse to go to school and they give their excuse like, I have a tummy ache, I have a headache, so they want to stay at home, right? Others are hyperactivity, running around, cannot stop the person, right? Persistent nightmare. Shouting, screaming, stick walking, and all that, right? Uh, persistent disobedience or aggression. Suddenly he becomes very aggressive. Right? You pull him on your back, you or your shower, or kick. And frequent uh, temper tantrums, right? Children. Usually for children to have issues, it's a manifestation or it's a symptom of what is happening at home. So you need to find out what is happening in the family, especially with the parents. For older children, you need to take note, substance abuse, I think Malaysia, I think you have the issue of drugs here. Yeah? In Singapore, we have, but very, the government takes it very seriously. I believe here also. Inability to cope with problems and daily activities. Um, children with ADHD or children who are feeling depressed. No? Uh, eating, sleeping disorder, complaints of physical ailment. Uh, changes in ability to manage responsibility and the list goes on, you can see that. So these are some of the indicators for you. However, you know that for children and uh, pre-adolescents, -ad uh, they may not have the, uh, what they call the executive uh, skills to help themselves. That means how to manage their behavior, how to manage what they do. So parents have to play a big role, unlike adults, right? So this is where you as parents will have to come in to help. Others, strange or other behaviors we need to take note of in adults, young adults or adolescents. These are some of the um, indicators that we need to be aware, especially working with someone in your family. Right? Sometimes you may ask, are these normal for adolescents? They sleep a lot. They only stay up. Like daytime, they are no longer, they are not around, especially weekends. Are these normal behaviors? Then you have to say, uh, the rest of the adolescents within the his or her social circles doing the same thing. So you give us an idea, especially you make a bit of a comparison, his or her social circle, right? So you, sometimes you don't jump into conclusion. Some of us are anxious ourselves. We tend to project the anxiety onto our children or those that you care. So check your own anxiety. Sometimes it's the parents' anxiety that is projected onto the children, right? So we as parents, you as parents, you need to take note of your own anxious feeling, right? Sometimes we parents, they over, overreact or they are put on what they call a, what drive, right? Forward drive. And they're doing a lot of things that sometimes you need just to take it easy and see, right? And ask, important thing, older parents, more experienced parents. We learn from each other. Hence, I think groups like these are important to form cell group, support group. Parents support group, children with, you know, let's say behavioral issues support group, autistic parents support group, and so forth and so forth. Support groups are very important. Okay? How to cope now? How to cope day to day? Many families who have a loved one with mental illness share similar experiences. There's nothing new under the sun. So if you have a child or you know someone with behavior issues, even if with elderly, yeah, Alzheimer's or dementia, you need to have a support group, especially for caregivers. If not, you get burned out and you'll give up, right? You, you yourself will feel depressed. So a support group is very important. Uh, you need to find yourself uh, denying the warning signs, uh, what other people will think. Of course, we've a child with mental or psychological issues, it is very, um, it is a challenge. It is, it can be a very uh, shaming thing for you if you that your child is not well. But I can assure you that parents who have autistic children, they find that it is a gift, it's God's gift to them. Strange that it may sound, but some of them say it is God's gift to them. Not only for them, but for their other siblings. It will teach you something that you will never learn if you have a so-called a normal family.
So don't don't say you know a parents with autistic children or a family with autistic child. It's a poor family, it's a bad family. No, it's not true. Remember to accept feelings are normal and common mom feelings uh, among uh, family members. So the idea here is, can we learn how to normalize and not stigmatize people or families, right? Because mental illness is very common these days. However, if treated early and well, families can be healthy again, can be working as a family again. Okay, these are some of the suggestions about handling uh, unusual behaviors. Uh, and there is what we call CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, to help children with behavior issues. But here again, it's one-to-one. -one. What we need these days is how to help parents better manage their children. Right? And parents' conference, parenting skills, parent management skills, those are very important how to help them to better help their children. It's good that they are able to get one-to-one -one help from the therapist. But at the end of the day, you are the one who will be helping your loved ones, not people out there, okay? Not people out there in my sense that full-time, you know, you are parents, I think you can do a better job. Yeah? And of course, you need support also, not alone. Okay, as I mentioned, support network is very important. And if you know of people who share, because sometimes if you keep quiet about your struggles and your pain, others do not know. So as a group, you, what you need to do is to come together. So like tonight, you know, you have a big group here. Are there common grounds we can come together to bring you together to support each other? For the very fact that if you are interested in mental health issues, can you better support the counsellors here in the parish to do something for the group, all right, for the community? Seeking counselling help, very important. We have a counselling centre in the parish here. Make use of it. If Father Larry is busy, look for others, right? You look for Nelly, you can look for um, Kimberly. Time out, very important. You in common for a for person with mental illness to become part of the focus of parent. Sometimes you need to have what we call a problem-free corner in your house where you don't only talk about Problem saturated talk. You need to go on normal holidays also, especially families with autistic children or family with children with hand, uh, emotional or psychological handicap. Right? You need to have normal family life. And how? Putting the illness or the problem uh, in its place. It's where needed, you focus on. You know, in some families, their concern is always with the weakest child or the child with the emotional or psychological problem. And they neglect the other children. So one of the things I mentioned to my friend who has four, four daughters, the youngest with uh, autism, is to don't neglect the other rest of the children in the house. You need to give time to them. It's not that you give all your time and attention. Yes, the child needs it, but also the, the elders need it, the second, the third needs it also. So make sure you give them equal time, equal attention. If not, they'll grow up feeling very bitter, right? That all your love and attention is to, yes, rightfully, you know, to the, the youngest who's having the problem, but you also need to take care of the rest of the children. Don't neglect them. So it says, many families who have a loved one with mental illness share similar experiences, right? And there's hope for recovery, provided you do the things that you need to do as parents or as siblings, right? or as a friend. A good friend is a gift from God, right? So we need to provide hope for families. There is recovery, provided you get the right kind of help. Okay, question? Clarification, comments. Yes, your name, please. Yes, Joshua. Yes. Yes, it takes a village. Right. 
Yes. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, they go straight to their computer games, yeah, the handphone, yeah. right? Okay. That's right. That's one point that um, I shared with the other, with my, the, my recent participants is that if you give your child a gadget, for example, an iPad or whatever, early in his, his or her life, to get him distracted or her distracted while you do your things, right? You watch cartoon. For, let's say, from the moment of first one year old, then later on, you know, subsequently. And by the time he or she reaches adolescent, 10, 12, 13, and you say, now I need to control your screening time. I'm going to take away your handphone. I'm going to take an iPad. What happened? He or she will scream because it is as if you're cutting a part of his arm or his leg, because the iPad has become, the, the handphone has become his or her body, right? I cannot live without it. Just like if you take away your glasses, you can't see. You will shout and scream. It's the same analogy here. If you give your child unregulated, uncontrolled time with your iPad or, or handphone, you don't expect to get it back again, right? So hence the onus is on who? On you as parents or as grandparents. So hence, we need to educate, and these are sessions in which we educate our, ourselves as well as our friends, that it's not easy to take away handphones or iPad later in life if you give your child early the use of it because it becomes a part of the him or her. It's like cutting off your hand. Do you want your hand to be cut off without shouting and screaming? Of course not, right? So be aware of what you give and what you do with technology. And the other thing, recently, my sister sent me, my sister at Kenoshan Nan, my Ta Jie, she sent me, uh, always sent me things from Pope Francis, right? Pope Francis messages. <laughs> and recently about Doubting Thomas. I mean, have you read it? A very nice write-up about Pope Francis' reflection on Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas, he needed a community to come back to discover who? Discover the risen Lord again. So we are the community, right? And we are, as a community, need to support each other, and especially in this area, mental health. Right? And the more support you can provide for this community here in this parish or in this archdiocese, the better it is. As you say correctly, we need a village to raise a child. We need you as a Catholic community, Christian community, to raise your children. Right? So I think it's an important thing. Other questions? Anybody? Yes, Bibiana. Okay. Educate parents, psychosocial education. A lot of what we do as therapists or counsel can be done first by, I mean, we we work upstream rather than downstream. We always say fire uh, therapy is firefighting. Right? By the time you go and see a therapist or counselor, it's a firefight. Why not we do upstream work? That is to educate your children, the young, uh, young adults about to marry, be married, about screen time, about healthy family life. Hence, I think education, psychosocial education, psychosocial ed is very important. A lot more that we can do as a community to psychosocial ed our young parents. And there's a program called uh, Young Couples on the Journey, right? Can we journey with young couples, especially older couples, forming a group? Say one uh, older couple with maybe three or four young couples, right? Can we do that? The church, as a church, I think we can, the cell group form, right? Can we support children through their parents? Start early. 
for one week. The other way, of course, the schools can do that also. Schools like St. Joseph, right? We need to educate. And children, if you get them too late, um, this area, when they get to university, they have no time. So you have to start as early as possible. You know, if you want to be good at something, what must you do? You have to start early, right? You know, the Chinese player, right? The gym, gymnast, the table tennis, the basketball, they start very young. And especially you want Kung Fu, uh, Wu Su, right? You start, what, three years old, four years old, right? So the younger you start, the better it is. That's why the Good Shepherd program is so, so effective, important for children, right? So hence, we have to start early. The earlier, the better. Other ways, you have to come together and put your head together and say, what can we do as a community? I think that's important. And Father Larry always had good, good ideas. Father Larry, question, yeah. Uh, two questions here. Uh, the first one is talking about, you talk about peer the shrine, about the spiritual being with uh, uh, physical experience. Yes. Now, we also know that many of us, uh, basically, we are driven by emotions. And uh, so as we are more uh, emotional being, mm -hmm. more than anything else, uh, past maybe we are like a lot of weight on emotional intelligence. You talk about uh, IQ, uh, what do you call so many Q and so forth, so called uh, SQ and so forth. SQ. And so far, I think past maybe from our own experience, we have not really learned to regulate our own emotions. That's one. The other one is talking about uh, I, for myself, come from a broken family. Uh, the dysfunctional dynamics not just from my parents, but I believe it's also from the parents, from parents and parents over. So these are what they call a vicious circle that inherited this uh, coming in there. Unless we have some form of how to break this vicious circle, it will be carried over and over again. Thanks, uh, Father uh, Larry. You know Father Larry's story, right? Uh, he, he came from uh, Chao Kiet, right, Father? <laughs> It's those gangster area, right? So you don't play around with Father Larry, yeah? He has martial arts, so you all be careful, right? So Father Larry is saying, what about intergenerational? Transgenerational generational issues, right? Abuse or whatever it is, right? Is there hope for a child coming from those kind of situations? Or is the person doomed because of your background, because of your upbringing? What do you think? What do you think? If you come from a broken family, you are doomed. You... No, very good. Why no? <laughs> Why no? Because Father Larry is a good example, right? Uh, from a tough area with tough parents, with all kinds. He turned out well, right? And not only well, he became my superior, my boss, right? And he was very kind to me, right? Why? I have one explanation. I don't know whether you agree or don't agree. It's called attachment. It's based on attachment theory. Safe attachment figure in your life. Secure attachment figure. You know the playgrounds, right? Children, if they run around, if they fall, what happens? They run back to their papa or mama or their caregivers, right? And what happens there? They will be consoled. Okay, don't worry. You know, it's just a fall. It's just a small cut. They'll be consoled, they will give soothing, right? Then after that, they run back to the playground and play again, right? So that parents or that caregiver is a safe attachment figure. Some of us may not have a safe attachment figure growing up, but your spouse now, people who care for you, maybe an uncle or auntie in your life, those people make a difference in your life. And that's why you, who you, you become who you are today. A very secure and attached person. So a secure, attached person, if you don't have it in your later life, maybe early on in your life, maybe somewhere in your later life, you may experience someone like that. It may be a good friend, a good uncle or a good auntie or someone that you trust, right? Maybe your godparent, right? Those people, in a way, substitute, maybe some, not substitute, what the word they use, help to provide the love and the care you need. That will make a big difference in your development as a person. Right? And some of them will you say God working through people of goodwill in a way to form and help you. Others can be probably you meet someone, a sister or a nun or a priest or someone, right? 
that makes a big difference in your life. Those are their safe attachment figure who can show love and concern for you to provide you with the ability to, to work and the capacity for love. Father, you want to say anything else? Uh, okay, basically, uh, just share my own experience. I think uh, from my own experience, you get a sense of what uh, it is the struggle. And I say, I come, I'm not only come from a broken family, dysfunctional, uh, but also I'm born handicapped. And this is where I'm doubly handicapped, emotionally handicapped, physically handicapped, and so forth. And so now uh, I've gone through really, as I used to share in my homily, three times I nearly went to commit suicide. And the last time I nearly succeeded. So given the sum of atmosphere here, there's attachment theory and so forth, I don't have all this of thing. And uh, looking back, and I was not coming from a Catholic family, I know neither God and so forth, but somehow in all strange ways, my own redeeming point for myself, it's not so much about support and so forth, while well, support is very good, but basically it's to the pain uh, that then I found the solution. The pain I'm going through. What really woke me up was basically, I do not want to go to all through this pain anymore. No more misery, no more suffering, no more of this. I'm going to end of this of thing. Uh, this was the one that really woke me up. And what I do? I do my own research, read about birds and this, and that was the one that really saved me. Not so much from friends or for anyone. It's from one reading that was really the one that helped me out. I read books on self-improvement. Why am I thinking this and so forth? The same thing with my cancer as well. Uh, research. Uh, what is it and so forth? This is where they give me research, give me the ideas and so forth and so forth. So, I certainly believe that coming from a dysfunctional family, broken family, suicide and so forth, is a great challenge. Whether I want to rise above it or whether I want to sink. So there was a choice and the pain is a great uh, teacher to me. There's one thing here. And also obviously as I later on you grow up in life, I learn more about how to regulate my emotions. Because you're driven by emotions, you're an emotional being. And if I do not know how to regulate my emotions, I will make great trouble. And so regulating my emotions again, I go for my self-study, online study, read this, read this. Aha, I said, this is how I go about it. So this basically is to share something about broken family, yes. I used to say, a good number of friends have never, never able to overcome this. Then I said to myself, how is it that I'm able to overcome it? Basically, when I went through the pain and so forth, I said, no more of this. I just uh, move on. Thank you, Father Larry. There's another version of how you can help yourself. Good, emotional, mental, will, power. Right? That's one way. But many of us may be less than a mortal, right? <coughs> so we need help. Father Larry was able to help himself. It's great. But a lot of us may need each other's help. I think that's also important. So thank you very much, Father Larry. So let us thank Father Larry for his sharing. <laughs> it's always a challenge, right? When we look at time, we know that we are going to end. And as, and as teachers, we always feel very anxious if we cannot finish our slides or if we cannot finish our work plan, right? So what to do? Pray, right? <laughs> no pray. This time what I'll do is I skip, skip, skip. I'll give you what is most essential here. Read this. Can you see from the back? Okay. I'll give you a few minutes to read. Or oh, maybe I'll read it out to you. Are you building a cathedral? There were two stone masons each doing the same job. The first, a melancholy man, was asked what he was doing. He says, I lay stones. He repeated, looking solid. Every day, stones and mortars, no difference. 
from one day to the next, I lay stones. I get paid. It was a dreary life. His colleague was asked the same question. His eyes brightened as he carried the next stone and laid it upon the others. He laid, I am building a cathedral, he exclaimed. So as you as parents, you as uh, children and family, what do you want to build? You want to build a cathedral or you just want to lay stones? So I leave that for your reflection in your life in the coming days. <laughs> so with that, I say thank you very much and God bless. Thank you for the love with you. Thank you so much, Father Charles. Uh, such an insightful uh, ending uh, that all of you will have to do your self-reflection. And this is what Father Charles is really good at. For the first uh, training that he gave us on marital first responder, I think Vernon can also, yeah, uh, you know, probably say the same thing in which like there's so much of a deep reflection. And today I think it's a start of a psychoeducation that all of you is asking, you know, what to do, what to do. And this is the first start and perhaps more to come, um, maybe from me or from somebody else. Um, but uh, look out now, church notices. And um, before you leave, um, I probably would like to ask if Father Larry, if you have anything as his superior, <laughs> if you want to say something, no, okay. Or anything that you want to wrap up, okay, no. Um, before you leave later, there will be a love offering box outside the entrance. Uh, we would really appreciate if you could uh, uh, give some love offerings just for our operation cost. And uh, I think is Archbishop, is he still around? I would like to maybe ask you to give the final blessing if you would please. Thank you very much. Just to say, I'm not uh, Father Charles Superior. Formerly, yes, but now I'm not the Superior. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> and now he's the Taka because he's older. <laughs> In the just way. All right, so you just remain seated because when you stand, we'll have a tung, 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 tung. So we'll do that at the end when we pray. And before the prayer, once again, I say thank you to Father Charles. Uh, for coming to help us uh, in the formation, training, awareness of mental health. Uh, I know you're looking. Uh, this is a sprain from playing. <laughs> I sat down so you are not distracted. I was playing uh, football. I was a goalkeeper with a seminarian. So occasionally you play football, goalkeeping, you get a little sprain. So it's a little while just to protect it uh, while it recovers. So nothing serious. But it means I can still play football, so press a lot for that. <laughs> uh, goalkeeping only, I cannot run so much. But all the same, uh, let's uh, thank the Lord. And I think I pick up on what Kimberly said. Go back and put into practice. Reflect and see how we can bring the blessings that we we'll learn to our family. It's not about uh, uh, how call that. Uh, what I can, uh, when I, I must attend more courses so I can do something. No, come in. when you do that, wherever you are, let's make a difference in our family. Let's encourage others' families' uh, parents so that way we encourage one another, as the scripture say, encourage one another all the time. All right, so with this, we pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God, our Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the gift of this wonderful auditorium under the Asha Season Courier and Cathedral Pastoral Center where we are able to use the facilities and when we can also sit back, relax, reflect, listen and be blessed by you. This evening, we thank you for the gift of Father Charles Sim for the counseling phase under the cathedral with Nelly and Kimberly. And we ask that you continue to bless us, bless our families, and especially our, the children, the students that are at the very concern of the building the current 
generation, the new generation that will be in a few years. In, in a way, will no longer be first. We'll be out for other places to study. But the time they have with us, we ask your blessing upon our family. And so this very evening, we are before, we ask that Mary, the mother of the family of Nazareth, pray with us for our family. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. Amen. And for all the blessings we have received, we thank our loving God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And may the blessing of Almighty God come upon you and your family, and especially the well-being of all the families, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Go and bring the blessing to your family at home. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Father Charles.